So, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to introduce a great economist, a, a fellow American, Professor Daniel Hammermesh. I'm, I've met him here, actually. This is an open, lively person, he, frank, honest, and he likes to listen to everybody, including his students in Austin, Texas University. And one of his students, one of his best students, actually suggested that he should uh, write down his observations, anecdotes, uh, uh, those examples that he would use during his lectures to illustrate his students how economic theories uh, are pervasive, are present in our uh, daily choices. And the result of this was a book. The result was a book, Economics Everywhere. Uh, which is at its fourth edition now. And actually, uh, in a book, in an interview for a book called Spousonomics, which is uh, applied to the uh, rules of economics, which, are, sorry, applies economics to the relationships between married people. And Professor Heimemesh said this is one of the so many fields in which using a bit of economic theory could be helpful in um, taking, uh, in improving, actually, uh, making progress in our knowledge of the world. Actually, there are so many things that cannot be understood without being aware of some of uh, the economic theory. And in his book, uh, uh, Economics is uh, Everywhere, uh, Hammermesh uses texts from lyrics from uh, Rolling Stone songs to illustrate the concept of scarcity. Or uh, her, oh, sorry, um, his uh, granddaughter's um, behavior. So he was one of the inspirators of the book uh, Free Economics, who uses economics to make provocative, very bizarre analysis, explaining, for example, that drug peddlers sometimes live at home with their mothers. This book sold four million copies, actually, and in was translated in 35 languages. And Hammermesh, uh, like the authors of Free Economics, is a mm, really quite unusual, bizarre think thinker. And he um, contributes to blogs in free economics. And actually, yesterday, he wrote one. And he uh, wondered uh, what the economic advantage was of a festival like this one. And this is the economics for the mass. Economics for the mass, actually. This is funded by the provincial government, by private companies. And so he wondered, why should the government spend public money on something like this? And in my opinion, because this educates uh, citizens, and even more so, this creates social capital. This creates cohesion among children, a cohesion which otherwise wouldn't be there. In August, a new book will be published, a new Hammamesh book, Beauty Pays, that's the title, showing that society favors um, those who are beautiful and quoting empirical data showing that being beautiful or handsome is um, something that uh, actually makes you find better jobs. You are favored uh, or privileged by banks when you look uh, for um, money. And usually you have also more beautiful spouses and more educated ones. And um, I think that uh, the, the title of our, of our festival, Econ the, the Boundaries of economic, uh, uh, of economic Freedom. And actually, this is something that also illustrates uh, Professor Hammermesh's work, uh, who has investigated the boundaries of economic theory. Today, he'll be talking uh, about what we do with our leisure time. That is, uh, and actually, the title is Freedom from Work. So we are very eager or looking forward to listening to Professor Heimemesh's presentation because he will be uh, helping us in getting a better knowledge of ourselves. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Steve, for the very kind introduction. And I want to make a few comments about the festival. Steve made the point that I made in the blog yesterday about why this might be a very good investment for the Trentino government. And I really do believe that. I would love to have a festival like this at home in Texas. Although I can't imagine the government in Texas spending money on anything, much less a festival like this. But I wish they would. Okay. The symbol of this festival, as you can see over there, is the squirrel. Okay. And I want to think about what the squirrel does if he suddenly has freedom from work. Remember, the squirrel has worked very hard collecting nuts, saving nuts, but it happens this was a very good year in squirrel land. Okay? And so there was an abundance of nuts, and he has a lot of time. The question is, what is the squirrel going to do with all that extra time? You might think, and economists have mostly thought, that people either work or don't work. And yet for the squirrel, the non-work time is not always the same. Take the squirrel's example. He could, for example, spend time chasing lady squirrels. This would be very enjoyable. On the other hand, one can imagine things he might do, which in his spare time are not so much fun. For example, stand there and look at the sky, because he can't think of anything better to do, or there are no lady squirrels around, which has been the story of my life until I met my wife. Anyway, you can see that time away from work, even for a squirrel, is not quite all the same. It's not homogeneous. And that's the motivation of this entire talk, namely, what do we do when we're not working? How is it changed? How does it differ across people? And what's going to happen in the future? Let me stress, I've been to several sessions. I went to Alan Kruger's session last night. I heard Jürgen von Hagen yesterday. All of the sessions I've been to, and many of the sessions in this conference, have to do with economic policy. So let's refer back to the squirrel land here. The squirrel is worried about his free time. This is not an issue of government, and therefore the premier of squirrel land, let's call him Signor Squirlisconi, uh, has nothing to do with anything over here. It's merely a matter of individuals and learning how individuals behave. So let's talk about this and go through a whole bunch of rather simple ideas which any economist could get if he or she spent his time thinking about them and getting data. So there we are. This is, in case you don't know who this is, this is the actor Johnny Depp. He has a new movie out this week. That's not why I'm putting his picture up. It's rather an ad from Mount Blanc Pens. And the crucial point there is time is precious. Notice he has a watch on his hand. Use it wisely. And that is the basic message of this entire talk. Time is scarce, and once something becomes scarce, it becomes economics, and we have something useful to say about it. It is true that money is scarce. We all want more money, no question about that. Uh, but for more and more of us, time is what's scarce. I know there's a recession going on now, and people are worried about jobs and money. Okay. Nonetheless, over the longer term, it's money that has become relatively abundant for most people in the Western and industrialized world, and it's time which has not increased very much. Let me illustrate for Italy and the U.S. So here we have tables for both Italy and the U.S showing GDP per capita, that's the amount of money in real terms that we have to spend. As you can see, looking down the left-hand column there, that in Italy in the last 50 years, the average person is probably four times as well off economically in terms of dollars than he or she was 50 years ago. Looking at the second column, though, life expectancy at birth has increased in this country, but you know, it's only increased about 15%. So the amount of money we have has gone up by a factor of four. The amount of time we have to spend it has gone up by a very, very minimal amount, only 15%. In the US, wealth has gone up only 300%. 
It's a huge amount, but our life expectancy has gone up only about 12%. So again, if you take the ratio of money to time, that ratio has risen tremendously. Increasingly in rich countries, it's time that is scarce. So the way I think about it is in terms of this little schematic here. The upper one shows two little dollar bills, and I'm sorry, they could be euros, it wouldn't matter. And a watch, a clock, and that could be a low wage individual or a poor country. A medium sized clock and not too much money. In the rich country and among rich individuals down below, the clock is still the same size, but the dollar bills are much bigger. And that's what's been happening over time in most countries outside the very poor developing world. And it's certainly what's true across people within the same economy. So let's keep this relative scarcity in mind. The time available to spend one dollar has been going down more or less steadily in my country. The time available to spend a euro or a thousand lire has been going down steadily in Italy as well. So let's talk about how people spend time away from work. Let's try categorizing, categorizing uses of time. And I want to categorize different things we do into four main categories. This is arbitrary. One could make any number of categorizations. It's like accounting, which is the most, well, as they say about accountants, there are people who weren't dull enough to become economists. It's really a boring thing. Economics is much more exciting, I think. So I want to make a fourfold classification here. The first one is very easy. Things you do for pay or time spent commuting to your work. I'll call that market work M. The next category economists call home production or household production, child care, cooking, cleaning, walking the dog, mowing the lawn, gardening. These are things that you could actually pay somebody to do for you. I could pay somebody to take care of my children, if I still had young children. I could pay somebody to mow my lawn, I do that. Pay somebody to do the laundry, pay somebody to iron my shirts and do the cleaning. Nonetheless, most of us do some of these things. We could contract them out, but we don't. The third category is what I will call biological activities, things we have to do some of. Sleeping, we all have to sleep. Eating, washing up, sex. These are things that you cannot pay somebody to do for you. You can pay somebody to have sex with you, but you can't pay somebody to have sex for you, okay? You gotta do it yourself. Maybe someday technology will change. Lastly here, leisure. This is everything else. Voluntary things that you might enjoy doing. Television watching, exercising, sporting events, religious activities. These are all not required, but we do them because we enjoy them. Let me stress this classification is quite arbitrary. One might, for example, say religious activities used to be things that you had to do. That's not true anymore. But as long as I make these categorizations in a given way, and like any accounting, keep them unchanged, I think we're okay. There is no problem with this particular categorization. Just to illustrate this, I like this cartoon. It shows a couple talking, and there's a man sitting on the couch, and the couple is talking, saying, that's the guy I hired to read Proust for me. Okay? You can't hire somebody to read Proust for you. You've got to go through all 4,000 pages on your own. And I'm sure almost nobody in this room has done that. I urge you, it's, 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 it's worth the time, but it's a lot of time. And as you get richer and richer, that time becomes more valuable. So let's look at a bit about how people spend time. And here are some data, as recently as I could get, for Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and the US with these four main categories of time use. And what's interesting is, this is for the average individual on the average day, it looks very much the same. Italians have a bit more leisure than the Dutch. Americans don't have very much leisure. 
we spend less time sleeping, we spend a bit more time at home, and about the same working for pay on average, according to these data. This is the average person. This includes people who don't work at all. It includes some, like professors of economics, who are working 70 hours a week. Okay? But the main point to note here is the remarkable similarity across countries in the amounts in each of these categories. If you break these categories down further, you'll find that work for pay is only the second biggest single thing that people do. By far the biggest individual activity that we engage in is sleeping. The most important thing we do about one third of a day. If you break these down still further, the third most important thing that we do is watch television. Indeed, if you add sleeping, working, and television watching, you account for almost two-thirds of what we have time to do. Television watching, by the way, is much bigger in America than anywhere else. It's a favorite American activity, bigger than in Italy, Germany, or the Netherlands, or anywhere else. Let's look at this further, and a lot of discussion of how people spend time deals with differences between men and women. So the question I want to ask is, away from work, away from the confines of work, do men and, different, and women do different things? And so here's the same data, the same four countries, breaking it down by gender. F is women, M is men, same four categories. And you'll notice, not surprisingly, that in each country, Work for pay is less among women than among men. It's true everywhere. In the US, they're a bit closer. In the other three countries, typically, the man is working for pay twice as much as the woman. On the other hand, the favorite economist phrase, work at home among women, housework, childcare, cooking, shopping, is much more among women than among men. That's true in all three countries. The third line shows the total work, work for pay and work that you could pay somebody to do, household production. And if you'll notice, Germany, women 445 minutes, men 436 minutes. Netherlands, 392 and 399. US, 472 and 476. There's an old American television show called Sesame Street for children. I don't know if they have this in Italy or not. And one of the favorite things was to show four different pictures and say one of these things is not like the others. There's a whole song about that. Look at these four countries and tell me which one of these things is not like the others. Okay. We'll come back to that in a minute. Americans spend less time in leisure, and a little bit less time in taking care of themselves, too. But the crucial point here is, by gender, there's tremendous equality in total work, except in one of these countries. What's really amazing is, if you do this for a whole bunch of countries, this graph relates well-being, wealth, real GDP per capita on the horizontal axis, to the difference in work between women and men. So if you look there at the zero line going across there, you look at most of the rich countries, US, Norway, Netherlands, Denmark, Japan, Finland, are gathered very close to that zero line. In most rich countries, in fact, there is very little difference in the total amount of work for paying at home that men and women do. There is one tremendous outlier among rich countries, and that is, if you notice, that dot up there, which is IO2, Italy in 2002, which is the most recent data we can get. Italy, relative to its wealth, women do an awful lot more total work than men. So we saw this anomaly Men do 75 minutes less total work than women every day. That's 10 hours a week out of 168. 
what are Italian women doing at home so much? Whenever I've presented this anomaly, everybody says, oh, they're cooking. No, it's not cooking. There's almost no difference between Italian women and other women. Of the total amount of time, two-thirds nearly, is extra time spent cleaning the house. Okay? That's the big difference. Okay? Italian women spend immense amount of time cleaning the house, and that's true in southern Italy and also in northern Italy. It's true for older women, but it's also true for younger women. For some reason, there's a norm here that women should spend a lot of time cleaning the house. If you go back on this picture here, guys, if I were an Italian woman being exploited here, working so hard, I would try to find a country where the guys do more than the women do. If you look down there, there's one wealthy country, Israel, where the guys do more work than the women. I think there's room for trade across the Mediterranean. The women ought to go to Israel. The Israeli guys ought to come here and find a wife who'll put up with this. It's probably not going to happen, but there's room for arbitrage here. OK, let's talk about changes over time and what's been happening over time. The problem with this is we have huge amounts of data on how much people have worked for the last 60 or 70 years. We have very little data for most countries on how they spend time away from work. For the US, we now can do this from 1965 to 2009. And in the UK, we can do it from 1975 to 2000. Whether the same trends look this way in other rich countries like Italy, I just don't know. The numbers aren't there. I have to assume that this is common in rich countries. So let's see what's happened here. First of all, to people generally, and then to men versus women. In the US, over this almost 40 year period, work has declined a little bit, about four hours a week. Work at home has also declined a little bit, also four hours a week. Americans today, despite our constant complaining, and I think I describe America as the land of complaints. That's the one thing we're really good at, that and higher education. Total amount of time working has gone down. In the UK, work time in the market for pay has gone down a lot. Work at home is basically unchanged. But the bottom line here is in total, we have more time for leisure and more time for biological things. By gender, however, it doesn't quite look the same. This is the US only, which have the better data here. For men, total work time in the market has gone down. You see from 53 to 40 hours per week. Whereas for women, as we all know, there are more women working in the US today, and they're working longer. Look at work at home, though. For men, American men are doing a bit more at home. Not much, three hours more, and a lot less than women, but they are doing more. Women, on the other hand, are doing much less at home. So if you add these together, you will note that for both men and for women, total work has gone down. Both sexes have more time for enjoyment. I'm very gratified by this. I've watched this happen over my adult life. I think it's a good thing. Who are the people who have benefited from this decline in total work? And there are tremendous differences by economic status and economic characteristics. And let's look at the major determinant of how well off one is economically, namely education. The role of human capital in determining how much we earn should not be underestimated. So let's look at people with only 12 years of schooling and those with 16 or more. Look at the first two lines and you will note that among people with relatively little education, work for pay has gone down tremendously. Among people with a lot of education, work for pay has gone down only a little. Work at home among those with little education has gone up. But the same is true for those with a lot of education. So that in the bottom pair of lines, 
we see that among those with little education, total work time has gone down tremendously on the order of 15%, whereas those with a university education or more, total work time has fallen from 60 hours per week to 59 hours a week, to the point that now those with more education are doing more total work than those with relatively little education. I'm depressed about this since I have a lot of education. And I want to ask the question, should you feel sorry for me? I mean, I'm working like crazy. I do a lot of the cooking at home. Uh, I work still, despite being very old, very hard. And this has been true over my entire life. The question is, am I worthy of your sympathy? Should we pity the highly educated people who are working so hard? The answer is unequivocally no. It's a choice, like most things in economics. They're earning more, and as you also probably know, the United States is currently the champion of inequality among rich countries, and that inequality has been going up. A large part of the cause for our increasing work among the well-off, among higher educated, is that it pays to work more. The returns to work have gone up. It's not surprising that rich Americans are also working more. It's also the case, and this is increasingly true in rich countries, that work isn't what it used to be. In a very real sense, more and more of us have jobs that are fun. It's not a matter of sitting there repetitiously pushing a button and doing the same thing for eight hours a day. Now I can sit for 10 hours a day and play with my computer, Skype my friends, try to write papers, teach interesting classes, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, work is more fun than it used to be. It's also the case among better off people. It's not just that the work is fun. The better off do more different things. They get more variety in life. They have less routine in life. So here I have data for Australia and Germany I can't do this for the United States, showing the number of different things that the average person does each day by level of education. And you will see going down the table in both columns that the people with more education do more different things. And comparing across days, they have fewer days where they're doing the same thing at the same time of day. They have more variety in what they do. They have more variety in when they do it. I like variety. Variety is good. There's an English phrase, variety is the spice of life. And my life as an educated rich person, person is probably spicier than that of a person with less education. All right, so far I haven't done any economics at all. To me, economics is the science of incentives, and I've said nothing about incentives. The question is, do incentives affect behavior? Let's think of something that everybody believes is fixed. I have a friend sitting out here who tells me he sleeps eight hours a day, which I find shocking. And given his income level, it's especially surprising to the point I don't believe him. This is data from a study I did with a colleague 20-some years ago, looking at the relationship between sleep and wages, and asking whether people whose wage is higher, whose incentive to work, whose time is more valuable, whether, given the high price of time, they in fact sleep less. And the answer is, for both men and women, they do sleep less, among men anyway. A person whose wage is half the average is sleeping about, well, almost 30 minutes a night less than a person whose wage is twice the average. Among women, there's very, very little difference. When women's wage goes up, they just tend to work a lot more. But men's sleep is highly responsive to their wage. There was a story in a newspaper about that about this paper, the headline was, sleep, why should I? It costs too much. Sleep costs money, and if it costs money, 
you do less of it. Next thing to think about, going back to my graph with the dollars and the clocks, is time pressure. In the United States, it's a badge of honor to say that you're busy. It's a disgrace to say, I have a lot of time. People are embarrassed, at least among economists, to say that, oh, I can do that. I have the time for that. People pretend to be very busy. Okay? It's a signal of how important you are. Is this an economic phenomenon? And who is more pressured for time, men or women? So here we have data for three different countries. The labels up top were left off, but the countries are going from left to right, the United States, Australia, and Germany. I couldn't get this for Italy. In each pair, the left-hand column is men, the right-hand column is F, women. What you will see for each country is firstly, that an awful lot of people say they're always pressured for time, they're always busy. Notice in the US, over half of women say they're always or almost always busy. Among men, it's a little bit less. What's also true, which is really interesting, is that in all three of these countries, and I'm sure it'd be true in Italy, women say they're busier than men. And given what Italian women are doing, cleaning the floors of the house, perhaps this is not surprising. Okay? Women are more pressed for time than men. Women complain more about being rushed than men do. Why is this? Very simply, women do more different things. Here I have this for six countries, listing the number of different things that men and women do. Blue is men, red is women. In every one of these countries, women are doing more different things. Women have to juggle different activities, and juggling is difficult. Women are called on if the child is sick to stay home from work and take care of them. That's true everywhere. And that's stressful. Women are managers of the household in most countries, and that's stressful. So I'm not surprised that, in fact, women do express more time stress than men. The other thing to note about this is who is busy? Who complains about being busy? Who's more pressured for time, the rich or the poor? Well, you think about that graph at the start of this discussion, for whom is time relatively scarce? Who had a lot of money and a small clock? The answer is the rich. So who should be the ones who are complaining about not having time? It should be the rich. And that's exactly what you observe in all three countries, plus also the Korea. So if we leave out, let 100 be the earnings of people who say they're always stressed. You will note going from those who are often stressed, which is black, to sometimes stressed, which is dark gray, to rarely stressed or never stressed, earnings goes down almost steadily as stress goes down. Not surprisingly, those who are most stressed, who complain the most, are those for whom they have a lot of money and relatively few euros or dollars. Should we feel sorry for the time stressed again? No. You want to be not stressed for time? I tell you what you do. Don't make as much money. Okay? Give it away and live a stressful, stress-free, time-abundant, money-scarce life. I don't see too many people doing that in my country or yours, and therefore, again, too bad. Suck it up. No problem at all. Complain, but don't expect me to sympathize with you. The bottom line question in this is, what would we do if we didn't have to work so much? What would we do with the extra time? What do we do with our extra time? And this goes back to one of my favorite quotes in the economic literature from John Maynard Keynes, who people should have heard of, even though he's pretty much ignored by economists these days. He was talking about what might happen if people didn't have to work so much. He says three-hour shifts or a 15-hour week may put off the problem for a while, but eventually Western rich society has to face the possibility 
that there just won't be so much need for work anymore. So what I want to inquire into is, what would we do, what do we do if we suddenly got extra time? Notice we have gotten extra time. We aren't working as much. But that's taken a long period of time, and I'm quite convinced someday we'll have a lot more free time. I hope so. I wish I had more free time. I wish I weren't a workaholic. I wish I weren't like that squirrel, here he is again, okay, who, like his friends the hamsters, is on a wheel running around faster and faster and faster, which is my description of American life. Two or three examples of this. First of all, every one of us gets one extra hour every year. On the first Sunday in October, no, it's the last Sunday in October in Europe, I believe, when you go on winter time. Isn't that correct? I think it's the last Sunday in October. In America, it's the first Sunday in November. And we had data from the Netherlands for two consecutive weeks, one of which beforehand, one of which right after, which included the day which was an hour longer. And the question to ask is, what did people do with the extra hour on the day that they went from summertime to wintertime? Ask yourself, what do you do on that day? And I, this gentleman is mouthing the word in English. The answer is, he says he sleeps. Okay, let's see. Here we have for men and women by marital status. So there's 60 minutes extra. What do they do? Married women, it's almost all extra sleep. They're so stressed and so busy, 53 of the 60 minutes are extra sleep. The only group where sleep doesn't account for at least half of the extra time is single men. What are they doing? They're out partying, playing football, or whatever. Notice 45 minutes of the extra hour among single men is partying, leisure, and so on. But for most of us, not surprisingly, this temporary but expected increase in time is spent in sleep. Okay? I wish it were true every day. What about when we retire from paid work? We all plan to retire someday. This is, of course, part of a long time planning thing. I have spreadsheets showing my entire rest of my life, both dollars and time. Other people might not be so neurotic, but we all do plan for retirement. That's why, like the squirrel, we put acorns aside for the future. Here are some data for Italy by age and I'll discuss the American data in a bit, looking at people who are prime age adults, 20 to 54, our two main categories, work for pay and work at home, and then breaking down biological things into sleep and other personal things, and breaking down leisure into television and other leisure. And as you all should know, let's compare just the first column, which are working age adults, to people like me who are, let's say, 67 or 68, that's the third column. And you'll notice from prime age Italians to people age 67, they're cutting back work by four hours per day, basically four and a half hours of work down to half an hour. So they're getting four extra hours per day to play with. That's an awful lot of time. What do they do with it? Well, they spend about an hour and a quarter more working at home maybe cleaning the floors even more, not taking care of kids, but taking care of grandchildren, which a lot of which goes on in this country, perhaps cooking, perhaps shopping. They spend almost an hour extra sleeping, almost no time on extra personal care, almost an hour of extra television watching, and very nicely, 45 minutes of extra leisure of other types. So it's very much split. It's not all one thing. An Italian, when he or she retires, uses his time or her time to expand all these activities. I've made up this same table for America. I was about to present it, and I said, maybe America is not typical, which is generally true. If you do the exact same table for America, 
you find the very depressing result that over half of the extra time is consumed in one activity, watching television. Okay. Americans who retire spend immense amounts of time in front of the tube. Italians, which I think is praiseworthy, spend much less time extra. A lot extra, but nowhere near as much extra as an American. Indeed, the 142 minutes that you see old people spending in television watching is less than the average American spends watching television. Maybe it's because the quality of our television shows is so much higher than elsewhere. After all, we have reality television shows and American Idol, which are surely very meritorious. The third question in this part to ask is, what if we had a permanent time windfall? What if something happened that said we just couldn't work, we're just as healthy, but we can't work as much? It happens in Japan in the late 18, 1980s, and in Korea in the early 2000s, the government legislated a decline in market work. People, just because it cost more for employers to employ them, essentially were told you can't work as much. How did people spend what I call the gift of time? So here is very briefly, it's not easy to see this, each vertical bar is a year, and it shows for each year up here what happened to market work. You can see that market work in 76 and 86 in Japan above was constant. And then market work, work for pay, fell like crazy. It's clearer in Korea, where in 1999, the average Korean, that's the lower graph, worked 350 minutes on a typical day. In the 2009, he or she had worked 40 minutes less per typical day. In other words, the government succeeded in getting people to work less. What did they do with it? Well, the one thing they didn't do, looking at the Korean graph, which is clearer, is increase work at home. There was essentially no change in the amount of time spent cooking, cleaning, shopping, taking care of kids. What did happen in Korea was a big increase in the time spent in biological activities and a small increase in leisure. In Japan, it was somewhat more mixed with a larger increase in leisure. But the main point is in this very clean example of being told to work less. People use the less work time to expand leisure and to expand things that are fun. In other words, that suggests to me, to use the economist term, that the extra utility we get from these activities is especially high. And if we could just somehow force ourselves or have the government force us to work less, we would use that time in leisure and in non-work activities in the house. None of the time was used for work at home. It was all used for other activities. The final area, which I think is worth talking about, is requiring people to take what in Europe is called holidays, what in America we call vacations. An interesting fact, which I noticed many years ago, and now that I spend a few months every year in Germany, it's even more clear to me. I spend two months in the Netherlands. We're always on holiday. I'm spending seven weeks teaching in the Netherlands. Six weekdays in those seven weeks are holidays. There's Easter Friday, Easter Monday, Queen's Day, the day after Queen's Day. This week is Hamelfart, that's Ascension Day, that was Thursday, but Friday's a holiday also. Week after next is Pentecost Monday, that's also a holiday. There are, I think, 15 public holidays in the Netherlands, I think 14 in much of Germany. How many public holidays are there in the US? I believe seven or eight. In other words, a week and a half less of public holidays, and it's also the case that mandated time off from work, vacations as we call it, in Europe, Germany, is five or six weeks per year. In the US, it's two weeks per year. 
And the evidence is very clear, this is not my research, that if we force people to take an extra week of holiday, they do roughly an extra week less of work. It's not that it's made up for elsewhere. In other words, in most of Europe, it's quite remarkable, people just work less. I think that's wonderful. The goal of life is not work. The goal of life is enjoyment. It's nice to have money, as I saw, it goes together with time. But we in these countries are quite rich already. And somehow I'd like to get my own country to get off the rat race that I see us in. The main point is that institutions, customs, and laws matter. My statistic on this is the average German is on holiday three times as much as the average American. There are three times as many Americans as Germans, and therefore at any given point of time, there are as many Germans on holiday as there are Americans on holiday, despite the difference in the size of the country. My first contact with Tito was he got me to be involved in a project five years ago, which resulted in a book, and he and I were talking, Tito Boeri and I, were talking about the title, and I said, how about the following title? Hours of work in the EU and US. Are Americans crazy or are Europeans lazy? That was my contribution. My answer is absolutely clear on this. I think Americans are crazy. I would like to require us to take more holiday. Regrettably, I don't think that President Palin next year will be doing that. What's the bottom line here? The bottom line here is that we're getting richer and richer and richer as societies. We're getting richer and richer and richer as individuals. Societies need to arrange institutions to accommodate the various different ways in which people can use non-work time. There was an American humorist, Will Rogers, who said, by land, they are not making any more of it. In other words, land is increasingly scarce as there are more and more people. That's not quite true. If you spend time in the Netherlands, they are making more of it up there. But by and large, land is scarce. But what's also increasingly scarce is time. You're not getting any more of it. It's increasingly limited compared to what you can do with it. And for that reason, it's also valuable to use time wisely. Thank you very much. Adesso abbiamo tempo per le domande vostre. We have some time for, for, for questions, for questions and answers. Something I forgot to say earlier on is that is what um, Professor Habermesh does when he's got um, free time. He's got six uh, grandchildren. He also goes uh, jogging every morning, I think. And then he travels, travels a lot since he's here. <laughs> so questions now? There are two here. Speak in English. <laughs> Which is where uh, uh, workers are, you know, where people get an extra hour a week at the end of daylight savings time. Uh, one could do the same thing in May when people get a fewer hour, one less hour a week when summertime goes in, right? And I suspect it would be a very asymmetric table. And the question will become, uh, what does that imply about the theory underlying all this? If giving people an extra hour leads to very different results than taking an hour away. Okay, the question is then, what if we had data from the day, the Sunday in late March, when Italy goes on summertime? Would it be that men, married men, sleep 43 minutes less? I don't know. I would like to get those data. The questioner believes that it wouldn't look like this with minus signs in front. Uh, I'm just not sure. I would bet people lose a lot of sleep also. Perhaps not as much, but again, the reason it wouldn't be as much is because 
most people believe they aren't getting enough sleep. And therefore, there is this asymmetry. So if you lose an hour, you wouldn't, in fact, cut back sleep by one hour. If you gain an hour, given how starved we all believe we are for sleep, we do, in fact, sleep the extra hour. Bene. Grazie della... Now, thank you very much for your very brilliant presentation. But don't you think, uh, Professor, don't you think that if we uh, consider our lives and we just don't, don't uh, base it on income and we consider it just as an exercise of curiosity and passion, wouldn't we be able to overcome this dichotomy between uh, fun and work? Wouldn't we be able then to get the same income we need and have fun at the same time? It's an excellent question, and I thank you for it. I think a lot of what we've seen over the last 50 years is precisely that mixing of fun and work at once, partly because technology has enabled us to have more fun, partly also because we want to mix fun and work one of my favorite cartoons was a picture of the effects of computerization on the workplace. It showed four people sitting in front of a computer screen at the job doing different things. One woman, it said, contacting old boyfriends. Another guy, it had downloading pornography from a website. Other ones were like that. We do combine work and play much more than we used to. This is because A, we like variety, and B, we like fun, and we're now able to have fun and work together. We are tending in that direction. Nonetheless, there are limits, and to some extent, we'd rather have pure fun. That's why the Europeans have six-week holidays. My, my question is about um, whether people really have a choice how much to work. So you were saying that we shouldn't pity the highly educated who work so much because it's their choice. And then towards the end of your talk, you said, well, if you give people an extra week holiday, they just take it as if they, they didn't actually have a, don't really have a choice of how many hours they, they work. See, it's, is working hours a choice or is it not? And to what extent it is? If it is not, so it's, it's a reason for government intervention in that area. It's a choice in two dimensions. First, it's a choice for individuals. We know there's a huge amount of work by economists on this. It's especially true for older people, younger people. It used to be true more for women than for men. That difference has now been lessened. But nonetheless, people's amount of work People's sleep, as I showed you, does respond to the returns to it. In other words, the price of something affects our behavior. Just like the price of spaghetti affects the amount of pasta I'll buy, the price of my time affects how much I want to work. We aren't creatures fully of institutions. Nonetheless, we are affected by institutions. We are affected by constraints on our behavior. And if we can get ourselves to be affected differently, if, for example, in the United States, we were to have requirements for more holiday time, that too would affect our behavior. But both prices and governmental mandates affect us. We are not creatures that are fixed somehow sociologically in these things. Are there other questions? per year do you mandate that your graduate students take? So the question is, how many weeks of vacation do I make my graduate students take? There was a book that came out recently uh, which had interviews of graduate students. One of their main complaints was how pressured for time they are. My feeling and how unhappy they were I remember a colleague of mine pointed to one of our graduate students and said, he smiles too much for a graduate student. I don't think graduate students should smile. They should be working hard. 
they're at a point in life where they should be investing in their careers, working as hard as they can to establish themselves and learn something. It's guys like me who should be taking all the leisure time. There's no investment possibility. My horizon is very short. So the answer is to your question is zero and negative if it were possible. Spero che ci siano altre domande. Io eh, faccio una domanda eh, nel, nell'aspettare, diciamo, eh, che... While we wait, I can ask a question. I mean, there is uh, one question here in the front row, I think. I have a question for you, however, in the meantime. More on psychology of work rather than on the uh, issue of your presentation, the top of your presentation. But since work uh, ranks second in a in a uh, ranking of how we use time. And since when we have the opportunity, we increase the hours devoted to leisure, etc. Is there a factor, a identity? I mean, do we identify with work more in the States than in Europe? Do you feel that we can be ident or do we identify ourselves with the work we are involved in? Is this psychological argument uh, uh, credible? I mean, what are the cultural factors? Because data nowadays show that in, there are no not so much there is no so much difference between cultures. What do you think about that? There are several answers to that. First of all, work is for so many of us, our major identifier. Uh, I do believe, and I've seen studies on this, suggesting that Americans do identify more with their work, whether that's because they really do, or it's just they feel they have to say that because they work so much, that's very hard to say. That's why I do economics and not psychology or sociology. I don't like what would happen. I like what does happen. Okay? Uh, it's sort of surprising in some ways. People should identify with what they do most of. By that criterion, I should identify myself, and most of you should identify yourself as sleepers. That's my major activity. Okay? Nonetheless, I identify myself as an economist. Actually, no, I identify myself as a teacher, as an economist secondarily. I think that's probably more true in the US, as you say, than it is in Italy or the rest of Europe. And that's unfortunate. Perhaps if we become more like Europe in these ways, maybe we'll start identifying ourselves as husbands, fathers, or even more important, members of a community, which is not what Americans typically do. Well, um, OK, in English and Italian, I don't know. Um, I have to ask you this question. You're so impressed with how much time women in Italy are spending <laughs> in cleaning the houses and the floors. And I have to ask you, what do you think is the reason for that? You said that women really enjoy uh, cleaning the floors, or there is something else going on in Italy that makes it a special place for women? OK, the question is, why are Italian women on their hands and knees cleaning the marble floors so much? We, I got to ask you. My, my co-author, Michael Burda, who gave a talk last night, had this vision of little old ladies in black dresses scrubbing marble floors. But the answer is, it's little old ladies, it's young ladies, it's everybody. And not all of them are in southern Italy, as I said. I can't believe that Italian women enjoy cleaning floors any more than American women do. Right. Nor do I see why they don't hire cleaning ladies, given that the price is no different than elsewhere. Right. Somehow, and I hate to say this, I believe it's culturally determined that this goes on. Why this cultural determinant still continues after all these years, I would love to see new data in Italy for 2011. Maybe this has changed. I hope so, because it stands out like a sore thumb compared to the entire rest of the rich world. Thank you. Is that a good answer? I don't it's think a, so. Yeah, I want an economic I answer. I just wanted to you know, hear you saying it. <laughs> and this young lady, after she's done here, is going to go back and do what? Clean the floor. Well, I'm professor of economics at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> 
C'è un'altra domanda sì, qua, se c'è tempo. Ah, ecco, ecco. Sì, sì. Faccio in italiano, tanto il professore. Right, I'll ask you in Italian because I know you get translation. What do you think of the recent idea of living your life slowly? In Italy we have slow food, slow life movement, so doing things in a different way, much more slowly and in a less hectic way. And then, uh, well, I believe that as your age progresses, uh, you still do many things, but it takes you longer. And an older person needs more hours for cleaning the home because it takes him or her longer also for personal care. I can see this in my father, who's 85 years old, he's perfectly independent, but it takes him three hours to get ready, whereas he was ready enough an hour when he used to go to work. So the efficiency of time, I mean, we always have to be efficient to achieve as much as we can, also when we wash each other, when we take care of ourselves. What do you think of this? Two separate questions here. Let me comment on them in order. The first question is the slow movement. I had not heard of this until this trip to Europe. Uh, one of our friends in the Netherlands is talking about going to a slow food restaurant. Okay? You know, I wonder about that. It may be slow food for me, but I'm not sure it's slow food for the person who is cooking it and spending time taking care of me. And so I wonder if this is just not another example of rich people indulging themselves. I worry about how real, a, a, uh, in terms of time saving, it is on average. I have no doubt that this saves time for the rich people who can afford to buy other people's services. But I wonder if it's true on average. I would expect this to happen more and more. Indeed, I wonder why we don't do more of that in the US where the price of low-skilled labor is so low, and professors and other wealthy people have so much money to buy things with. So I'm not sure I believe that, in other words. It sounds real good. Uh, there was a book in 1971 by a man named E.F. Schumacher called Small is Beautiful. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember that book. And it was the same sort of thing, that somehow it's good to do less and so on. This had no impact on us at all. The efficiency argument that the questioner makes about when we get older, I have no doubt watching my aged mother last year at age 92, it took her forever to do almost anything. But in the table I have up there, we're talking about people 65 to 69. And I am absolutely convinced and would be very angry if somebody told me they were less efficient at sleeping, TV watching, going to the movies or anything else like that. So no question you're right about the very old. But among people who are retiring these days at age 60 or 65, the evidence is absolutely clear health-wise they are just as healthy as they were 30 years ago, with a very few exceptions. And I would assume also just as efficient in using their time. It's rather that people want leisure. And if forced to take leisure, they happily accept it. And when they have enough money saved aside to keep themselves not worried that even if they live to 95, they'll have enough money, they will spend more time at leisure and spend it very efficiently also. How, how is influencing the trend of uh, working for pay at home the results of your research? I'm not sure I understand the it's question. About the teleworking or working oh. at home, home working. Okay. So telecommuting, for example. Well, uh, actually, I'm a good one to ask. Essentially, I do telecommute. I do most of my work at home. I can work on the computer, I can do my email, I can look at Facebook, heaven help me, and things like that. The virtue of working at home, the reason it's so attractive is you can do what the questioner earlier said. You can combine work for pay and household production with regrettably occasional biological activities 
like getting more food and having a snack in the middle of the morning. But in terms of telecommuting per se, even in the US where it pays to telecommute because communications and travel is so difficult, commuting to work is very difficult, it takes a long time, even there it's only a small fraction, below 10% of people who say they telecommute. So I think this is an increasing opportunity for variety, an increasing opportunity to save time, but it's still just not very widespread. It just isn't that important yet. Hello. Hi, hi on, on the question. Um, if, if, if you look at Germany, they have a lot of holidays, the Germans, say, and uh, um, they are thriving in a globalized wor world, so they the economic, uh, from an economic point of view, they're very successful. Does it mean that we can have both? We can have a lot of holidays and economic success, or it's just a temporary blip and they're going to pay in the long run um, with so, well, not being as successful as they are at the moment? Well, the Germans have had this many holidays for quite a long time. I mean, there's nothing new about this. And it was only 10 or 15 years ago when they had to absorb East Germany that people were bemoaning the high unemployment in Germany and the tremendous problems they have. We pay too much attention to the short term. I remember the big worry in the US in the 1970s was the Japanese are going to take over the world. They're selling us everything, we can't compete, and yet Economically, in the last 15 years, people view Japan as a basket case. The current fear, and their papers being given at this conference, I think Alicina's paper, is how the Chinese are taking over the world. You know, I'm sure it'll be the Brazilians in 15 years who we have to worry about. These things come and go, but in the end, they're all good things. I don't think any of this has to do with holidays. I think we choose what we want in the holidays. I think the productivity effects within a substantial margin just aren't very great. So I don't think the Germans will pay a price for this because they've had it for a long time in both bad times and now good times. I don't think it's an issue. Ci sono altre domande? Ultima domanda, facciamo se c'è. One last question. Um, you showed data that people with a university education in the U.S. are working longer hours now than those without it. And my question is, are they being paid for those hours or are they university professors and managers that are just working longer hours? And is there a way to, to disentangle that kind of data? The answer is very clearly yes. Certainly, university professors are not paid the, by the hour. I know that if I work one more hour, I will not get an extra $10 directly. But if I work an extra hour, if a manager works an extra hour, he or she will impress his or her peers, et cetera, et cetera, and earn more. And there's no question that the gains from working an extra hour in terms of total earnings for the very higher educated people have gone up tremendously. And it's not just true for people who are like the 90th percentile compared to the average. The very, very top people, the people in the top 2% have seen the biggest increase in the returns to work per hour. The big change has been at the very top. I'm not quite wealthy enough to have benefited as much as most other people from that, sadly. Grazie mille al professor Hammermesh e anche a voi che siete venuti ad ascoltare. Thank you very much, Professor Hammamesh, and thanks to all of you for coming here today.